I think we can start now. Um, Naomi, you want to make sure we can hear you? I think yeah, you should be on yeah. the okay, we can hear you. So okay. I didn't see who that was that asked me that question. Could that you just tell was me? Bella Weinberg, who asked you Bella the question. Bella Weinberg, who said that she Where did Sarah were... Schneer get her teachers from when she first started? Right. And she also said she knew my family and her, her family. So Sarah Schneer got her first students um, and her first teachers in the same place, in her dressmaking studio. Um, the dressmaking studio was was the first school, um, and she was, as I said, she was a high end. People call her a seamstress. She was a high end dressmaker. She had this sort of cream of Orthodox society. Um, her first teacher was also a student, and then was her apprentice. Was the her her dressmaking apprentice, um, and she taught her also Torah. At a certain point, she got so busy that she gave up the dressmaking and she just focused on the teaching. Um, and the first seven students were, it's the greatest aristocracy to be among that first class. There's different stories about how many there were. Some people say seven, some say 25. Kotomar, Bigamatria, 25. Ko, Kafhe for the first 25 students of Sarshnir. But, um, in 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 the uh, later on in this lecture, I'll tell I'll show you the um, a the report card of one of the first seven students. And you should always work very hard in school. I always say because you never know where your report card is going to going to end up. But this one ended up on my talk. Um, so th th this woman's name, I think, this girl's name was Devira Birnbaum. Her mother was Sarishner's customer. Um, and that was how she made connections in, you know, when she had a customer who had a young daughter, that was how she, uh, she, she um, assembled her customer base. So, so excellent question. And um, why don't I, I just rewind a little bit and say what this class is gonna be about. So the basic theme of this, gonna, of this class is gonna be Beis Yaakov between Vienna and Krakow. And I'll explain why those two cities are so important and what I mean by that. Um, and in answering that question, I think I'll also answer, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer the question of how it is that a seamstress dressmaker with very few connections in the Orthodox world, very little money, very little social status, Etc. was able to succeed uh, to the extent that Star Schneer was. Um, so so to, to go back to the beginning, the, let's say the beginning of Beis Yaakov is this um, epidemic, let's call it. Maybe that's too uh, relevant a term. We're trying not to think about where we are now, but um, let's say a, a, a wave of um, girls going off the derech, as we now call it. That wasn't what it was called um, then. And I think then it was a little graver because it often meant conversion to Christianity or becoming a prostitute. In other words, um, leaving the Orthodox world was a, a, in some ways a more dramatic thing to do. Um, and to explain the background to that, I have to go back even further what, to answer the question of, why is it that it was primarily, not primarily, there were also many young men and boys leaving the Orthodox world, but it was certainly a bigger problem with girls in Krakow. Now there have been waves of conversion before. This is one of the first few waves of conversion, big waves of conversion that have been so gendered female. Um, there were 300, um, around 300 conversions to Christianity by Jews between the last decade or two of the 19th century and the first decade or two of the 20th, and they were overwhelmingly female. So why? Um, how is it that this was about girls? You think about girls as being more protected or whatever your stereotype might be. It doesn't seem as if that that would be the case. And some of these girls were very young indeed. And um, one of the cases I'll talk about is, is of a 13-year-old girl. So um, how did this happen? And, and to understand this, you have to go back to a law that was passed in 1868 in, 
in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg Empire, was a kind of modernizing law, which is that all children in the empire, including Galicia, which is where Krakow was, um, all children had to go to school for at least eight years, um, which is exactly what Sarah Schneira had, by the way, eight years. Um, it was legally, that was what you had to do. And if you didn't send your kid to school, you'd have to pay a fine. Um, the, and these schools were at the beginning were kind of public schools. Later, it became fashionable also to, for people to send their girls to private schools. And these private schools were typically Catholic schools. Um, so the, um, the thinking was in those first years that there weren't enough schools and let's send the girls to the schools. It's less of a, it's less of a problem from the perspective of Torah study for girls to go to, um, to go to a public school than it is to send the boys. The boys are the future of the, it was, it was just felt that the boys had to be protected, quote unquote, from public education, from secular education, from learning. Um, German or Polish, both languages that Sarchner knew very well. Um, they had to be protected from that. They had to go to school along the traditional methods. And there was one um, interesting character, Aaron Marcus, was a, a, a German Balchuva who moved to uh, Poland to become a kind of Hasidic uh, Jew. But he had a, because he knew German, he had a sort of position as a kind of activist and broker in the community. And his great scheme was that it's going to take him decades to get the, enough schools for everyone. Let's fill up the schools with girls. Um, and in that way, at least postpone the problem of what to do about our boys. Um, and Aaron Marcus later was to rue his own decision. So basically what you have is girls going to school being introduced to especially literature. They seem to love literature. <laughs> I'm speaking now for myself too. They love to read, they learned how to read. And what you get is a kind of, um, again, I don't wanna use the word epidemic, but just a, a wave of, of girls immersing themselves in secular literature. And the secular literature basically taught them um, about romance. And um, this is the ideology that the, the, the novel provides. Um, and when you read about romance and in your own world, people want you to get married to someone your parents pick out at a young age, there's an obvious uh, conflict. Um, and you get a wave of girls not wishing to marry the young boys, not wishing to marry a, a yeshiva boy or a young chassid. Um, one of the things I say is that Beis Yaakov basically, job number one of Beis Yaakov was to make a yeshiva boy more appealing to a girl. So it's obviously two parts of that. So um, along with this, Kind of, so, so let me describe, uh, give you some details about this particular, why is this not, um, oh, there we go. So this is just, th this stuff was in, in the newspapers all the time. The, the middle article, in, in the middle of the slide here, I actually found in a, a Perth, Australia newspaper. So what you get is not only waves of conversion to Christianity, and I'll talk in a minute about um, what was called the international white slave trade, which is um, young girls uh, being sort of caught up in sex traffic. But you get a few really, really famous and, and um, uh, internationally covered stories. The story of Michalina Aretin is one of them. She's a girl from a Gerer family who ran away um, from home. It's in the Orthodox world, well, in the Jewish world, um, the story is that she was kidnapped by nuns from the, the uh, uh, what's it called, the Abbey. Um, Rachel Manikin, who's really the great historian of, of Galician Jews, has actually read the police reports. And it's, she 
is fairly sure, persuaded that Michalina was leaving to marry her boyfriend um, to, con to convert to Christianity. The monastery, the picture on the bottom in the middle of the slide is a picture of the Fel Felician Sister Monastery, which made a habit of quote unquote rescuing young Jewish girls. Um, they also had a little school, so they were teaching. And as I said, it was fashionable for Hasidim, for well-to-do Hasidim to send their daughters to Catholic schools. They were considered to be somehow both more fashionable and maybe a little safer. Um, in any case, that's um, that may have been where Michalina met the nuns, I have to ask Rachel, but the nuns took in dozens of Jewish girls um, and converted them. Um, and they, Michalina, the reason why Michalina's case became such a cause celeb as opposed to others was one, because she was 13 years old, though the nuns argue that she was actually 15, so already an adult and no longer under her parents' um, guardianship. Her parents insisted she was 13 and took the case not only to the courts, but also to the emperor, Franz Josef, um, and made a big stink. They had a lot of money. They got nowhere. Um, Michalina ended up marrying a non-Jewish man and then um, somehow someone from her Jewish family contacted her in the 50s, I think, and this all of this happened in, in around 1890, I think January 1st, 1900. What a date to remember. Um, she ended up moving, when her husband died, she ended up moving back to Israel. And I think this is her niece who wrote this book. And then the story was passed along that she had been kidnapped by the nuns, but that almost certainly didn't happen. Um, so she was just one of the many women. Another very famous case um, which happened later in 1908 or 1909, I think, was the case of Anna Kluger, who was the descendant, the direct descendant, the great-great-granddaughter of the Sanzer Rebbe, the founder of the Sanzer dynasty. So Sarah his first helpers in her school were uh, the Halberstam family that were also from the Sanzer um, dynasty. So the Hannah, uh, Hannah Kluger, later Anna, um, was uh, actually left her, she was already married when she left the Orthodox world. Um, and she left to, uh, she left her husband at the age of 17 and for good measure, she took along her 15 year old sister, younger sister. And the two of them tried to enroll in um, uh, Yagalonian University. And um, as if that wasn't enough, they also sued their parents for the tuition money and for support. And the university students marched in support of them. So this was another one of the cases that was everywhere um, in all the newspapers. I mean, this was just uh, uh, students in support of this Hasidic girl running away from her family. And this was a uh, just, devastating for the Hasidic world, um, incredibly embarrassing for one thing. Um, they, uh, you know, were not successful usually in getting their daughters back or in cover or in doing things secretly. Um, and they were making no headway. And this is the kind of, and, and uh, maybe I'll just say one more thing, which is that it was absolutely clear what the solution to the problem was. And Bertha Pappenheim, who I mentioned uh, last week, came to um, Galicia and spoke to Hasidic Rebbe's. In 1912, she talked to the Alexander Rebbe. And she said to them, um, you have to educate your girls. This is actually, maybe this is the next slide I should be talking about. So this is, um, you know, along with this wave of conversions to Christianity, um, among generally poorer girls um, was also a wave of girls um, getting caught up in what was then known as the international white slave trade, which was um, um, basically international sex trafficking. It wasn't exclusively a Jewish business, 
but it was largely a Jewish business. I, 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 you know, you could look up the statistics of some very high percentage of the pimps and the prostitutes um, came from Eastern Europe. And those who fought against it uh, claimed that Eastern European Hasidic or Orthodoxy in general was to be blamed for this high percentage of girls being caught up in it, that girls weren't taught. Um, that was part of the gen they, they weren't taught to identify as Jewish. They were um, very radical things were said. Bertha Pappenheim said, they're taught that they're just um, needed for their bodies to give birth to Jewish children. So giving birth to Jewish children and having sex with men, those are two related things. And as long as you ignore their spiritual development, um, this this plague will continue. Um, the, uh, let me just say a word on who these prostitutes are. Some of them, no doubt, kind of willingly went into the business. They weren't all trapped, but many of them were were seduced or 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 even kidnapped. Or the the one typical way of in which a girl would be caught up in, in prostitution was some man would uh, approach her at a train station as a period of, of migration and a lot of social dislocation and basically propose marriage to her. Um, and she would say, okay, the marriage would happen and it would turn out to be, um, next thing she knew she was on a boat to Argentina to a brothel along with five other uh, young women who the same man had proposed marriage to. Um, and these movements against it set up, set up kind of information booths at all the big um, railroad stations, traveler's aid. That's one of the things that, that Berta Pappenheim did. Um, but one of the other things she did, and this is why the rabbis got involved in this, is that um, part of, there were two issues that it was felt that the rabbis could help with. One issue was to make it easier for agunas, uh, women married to men who had disappeared, who either immigrated or during the war, soldiers who had died and there's no body, um, easier for women to, um, uh, for these women, these kind of trapped women, to free themselves from a, a, a husband that could no longer support them so that she could find another man to marry and who could support her. Um, and the other issue, which is a very, very complicated thing to do according to Jewish law, and these feminists, Orthodox feminists in the interwar period got nowhere. I, you read, uh, you know, um, what's the word, uh, conference after conference of, of women pleading with the rabbis and pleading with the rabbis. Um, the thing that I think could have actually been done and also wasn't done was to make Jewish marriage harder to contract, to insist not only on two random witnesses who could be, you know, this pimp's best friends, but on a rabbinical certificate of some sort. And this there actually was, I think, more headway. Um, this is no longer an issue now because those kinds of marriages are a thing of the past, thank God. I mean, this, this whole issue of, of the Jewish participation in, in the sex trade basically went away, not because anybody was successful in fighting it, though the woman, Rachel Jacobowitz on the bottom, she's the one who broke up the Migdal Tzvi, um, the biggest prostitution ring that was an international prostitution ring, but centered in Argentina. She's a real hero, and there she is with photos of, uh, you know, dozens of her sisters um, that she saved from, from this really violent world. Um, it's not just prostitution, it was also violence and et cetera, rape. Um, so this was this is a little bit of the background to what Sarah Schneer was dealing with. And I'll just say right off the bat that what I was always told is that nobody thought of giving girls a Jewish education until Sarah Schneer came along. That's not true. I mean, first of all, it was being done elsewhere, but it also wasn't being, it, it's also not true because it was, the solution to the problem was everywhere. Everybody had the same solution. The solution was uh, giving girls a, a, not just an education, not just 
you know, lock them up and make them do things, but imbue them with the beauty, the, the power, the, 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 whatever it is that the boys were being imbued with. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So this is the background for, and we all know about, hopefully you know about the Aguda, which is the still existing organization of Orthodox Jews, a political organization, which also, also has a religious dimension, I mean, obviously religious dimension to it. Um, so this, this particular problem of, that I've just been describing is in the background of the, the, the basic attempt to create an organized Orthodox world. The, the Orthodox world organized pretty much around this problem. Um, there were other issues that were discussed, but this was the big one. This was the big international one. And it's, it's no coincidence that the, um, the man who convened this conference was um, uh, uh, Mendel HaKohen, the chief, the chief Ashkenazic rabbi of Cairo. Um, and Cairo, Istanbul, and Galicia, and South America were were uh, stations on the international sex trafficking uh, route. Um, and when he came to Krakow because Krakow was in some way the center of world Jewry, and because so many of the prostitutes were coming from um, uh, that region. And um, he tried to organize a discussion around this issue. And uh, one problem was that it was, there was an audience. Um, people were so, this was such a brand new idea of organizing rabbis to talk about. Rabbis, you know, would confer or they would meet, but a, a, a political organization, a conference um, was such a brand new idea and of such great interest that it was covered in the press. And there were reporters there. Um, and when it came right down to it, it was impossible to talk about the international white slave trade because it's pasnished. Um, you can't talk about such things um, in public. Um, so some people tried to get around it. How do you talk about this? So let's not talk about the problem. Let's talk about the solution. Um, and various people said, we know what the solution is. We have to start schools. Um, and, and then the, 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 the problem of, is it allowed? Because in the Talmud it says, um, anyone who teaches his daughter Torah, or presumably a father who teaches his daughter Torah, teaches her tiflut, how do you translate that, tiflus? Licentiousness, uh, frivolity, it's this very hard to translate word. And it also, the, the, the halachic problem is, is complicated and why, why teaching someone Torah is teaching them frivolity is hard to understand. But in any case, it's been taken as a prohibition against teaching girls Torah. Um, the way around it has been obvious, at least since Maimonides, Torah stands for Torah Shabal Peh, the Talmud. The Talmud remains the domain of men, women can study the written Torah, which is the Torah, the Bible. Um, the question of biblical commentaries is, is a kind of gray area that has pushed back and forth in both directions at various times in Beis Yaakov history. And also there's another gray area, which is Pirkei Avot, Pirkei Avos, from the beginning standard in Beis Yaakov um, uh, curriculum and still is. So, so it was kind of obvious what to do, and yet it wasn't done. And this is what I talk about in the first chapter. One of the reasons it wasn't done was because of a kind of problem, a political problem, a cultural problem. There's a problem that you need to come up with a solution to deal with the modern problem, but the solution looks modern. And if the solution looks modern, then you look modern. And the, these rabbis did not want to look modern. Um, this is a problem all the way through the Beis Yaakov, the history of Beis Yaakov, that you risk looking like a modernizer, like a reformer, like a somebody doing something new. You're not allowed to do something new. It was already, it was already a new thing to have a conference. And this, this conference um, did not succeed. 
um, Mendel Akon went back to Cairo and it just he had just gotten stonewalled at every step. There were attempts to start Jewish schools, they failed. One reason I think it was the case that Sarah Schneer, um, in my opinion, this is my opinion, um, why she succeeded where they didn't is that the problem of looking modern and what are the other people going to say didn't hold for her at all. Um, she was a freak because she was religious. Um, her friends thought she was the strangest thing to, you know, nobody had ever met anyone like her. I mean, everyone around her was more modern than she was. She was a crazy religious fanatic. That was her, her nickname was um, uh, Chassidka, little, little Chassid. So clearly she's not worrying that someone's going to think she's modern. So that's, that's one free thing she had that no one else had. She wasn't in a world where she had to watch out who thinks she's doing something that's modern. She was outside of that completely. Um, the other thing is the whole question of, of how you get around a rabbinic prohibition. First of all, women are not supposed to be quoting the Talmud. So if she doesn't quote the Talmud, no one's gonna expect her to quote the Talmud. Of course she knew the Talmud. Of course she knew the prohibition. It was everywhere, it was in all the newspapers. Everybody knows it. But she could, she could start women's Torah study from scratch, from a place of pure love of Torah. Without apologetics, it would be better if we didn't have to do it, unfortunately, for our time. Yeah, that's another thing. The other aspect of why we can do it now, which is in all the male response, is unfortunately, because of our sins and because of the terrible things in our time, we have to let girls learn Torah. Now, if you're going to get around a, a Hasidic father, then it's good to know those arguments. And no doubt Sarah Shneira knew them backwards and forwards. If you're going to attract a young girl and your sentence with why she should study Torah starts with, unfortunately, you've already lost that case. So Sarah Shneira did not use the language of unfortunately. Unfortunately, the language of, of unfortunately, maybe I'll just say one more sentence, which is it's a technical thing, which is called Horasha, the needs of the hour. If there's some emergency comes up, you have to do something, even if it's a terrible, grave sin. So Beis Yaakov was permitted by the male authorities on the basis of Horasha and this kind of, we won't do the oral law. Those were the two permissions. Sarah Schneer, none of those things applied to her. What applied to her is the Torah is a beautiful thing. Everyone should study the Torah. There is nothing more joyful and, and life-giving than the Torah. Come to my studio park with my studio. Let me teach you Torah. That was Sarah Schneer. She didn't get involved in what could be called the rabbinic nitpicking. Um, and she didn't have to get involved because as a woman, you're not supposed to do that. That's a male activity. So she was free from having to do the nitpicking, which meant she was free to infuse women's Torah study with intrinsic value. Um, that's what she did. She gave, uh, she gave women's Torah study intrinsic value. Okay, let me, um, we haven't yet gotten to the theme really, which is uh, Vienna, and, uh, Vienna and Krakow. So the founding of Agudas Yisrael, Let's say there's a, a kind of first attempt in 1912. Agudas Yisrael was founded not by the rabbi of Krakow and a few from people in Krakow that were afraid to move too close to him because is he really Jewish? He's from Krakow, he's from Cairo. It was founded by a group of, the, the main impetus was uh, from Germany, it was a group of neo-Orthodox uh, German Jews and if you want to, there's um, um, Jakob Rosenheim, Morenu, he's called our teacher, Jakob Rosenheim. You can see he looks like a proper German gentleman. He's the great force uh, in the founding of the Aguda. Um, but he, he was strategic. He realized German Jewry is small. If he wants to create a political organization to deal with the pressing problems facing the Orthodox world, he has to get buy-in from the East, which is where the, the Orthodox masses were. He got buy-in from the Gera Rebbe, sent his son-in-law, and the Chafetz Chaim, the great um, 
I don't know what to call them, the luminary of Eastern European Jewry, the, the saint, the, the halachic um, decisor of all decisors, the, um, the writer, the, you know, the grocer also, um, he got his buy-in and there's a, a video of the Chafetz Chaim at this amazing event. Um, and uh, I was saying it started in, it, there was a kind of initial attempt to get the East and the West together in 1912 in Katowice, which is on the Polish-German border. Not surprisingly, that's where they held it. Um, and then efforts kind of fell apart over the course of the First World War. Um, but during the First World War, ties continued to strengthen on the individual level between German, they're sometimes called the doctor rabbis, so rabbis with a PhD, and their kind of counterparts without, not only without a PhD, without a high school diploma in the East. Um, so some of those ties are relevant to our history here. And what you see here is the grand um, beginning of the Aguda, in, which met in Vienna in 1923 for the first uh, World Congress, and then again in 1929 for the second World Congress. And among the other um, um, topics on the agenda uh, were, was girls' education. It was the first thing discussed at the opening of the 1912 conference. Um, this is where Aaron Marcus said, I'm so sorry, it's all my fault. I was the one who told those girls, told, told parents to send their daughters to these schools. Um, he spoke, various other people spoke, um, and what, what it looked like and what the issues were um, began to be clearer. And it also began to be clearer that um, it was already clear even in the 1903 conference that German Jewry would have to provide the basic model for what to do. That German Jewry had worked out all kinds of things a, half a century before that Polish Jewry was already struggling with. Um, at the 1903 conference, they were saying, um, some, we, should write books for, we should write books for Jewish girls. And one of the... Um, uh, and, and someone said, but we would have to vet them. A committee of rabbis would have to vet these books. And, and then someone else said, do you think any girl would want to read a book that a rabbi had written or vetted um, after they've been reading, I don't know, the Montpassant or whoever they were reading? Um, and someone said, you know what we should do? The German Jews already figured it out. They have their writers who write their novels. We're going to bring, we're going to translate those novels into Yiddish and to Polish for our daughters. And these are novels that are kosher for Jewish girls. They're novels about Jewish history, etc. Um, in 1923, it went even further. Um, this idea that German Jewry could help Eastern Europe with its problems, um, particularly around issues of, of girls' education. Um, this was formalized when a fund was uh, formed. It was called Karen HaTorah, the Torah Foundation. Um, and a German Jewish educator, um, administrator, Leo Deutschlander was appointed to run it. Um, he'd already had a lot of experience in Eastern Europe helping um, other educational initiatives um, during the First World War with the occupying German government. Um, and he was both the fundraiser for Beis Yaakov. It was obvious to everyone that there was a lot more money on the German side of things than in Poland. He was the fundraiser and he was the administrator um, of Beis Yaakov, basically. He, he helped professionalize it. In 1923, at that first Knes Yagdola, First World Congress, um, the Karen Hatar was found, founded and among its first initiatives were the, the um, financial uh, take, taking over Beis Yaakov um, and financially and professionalizing it. Took him a couple of years to get around to actually doing that, 1925. Um, and also it was decided that Mayor Shapiro was appointed or, or supported in his dream of creating a first-rate yeshiva. So these are parallel initiatives. Uh, uh, you know, the Harvard of the yeshiva world and a, a, a high-end seminary for girls 
um, undertaken in, during the same Knesset Yagdullah and more or less part of the same Karen Hatora initiative. Um, so, and I'll just point out because this is a little teaser for next session. Um, I'm pretty sure, maybe someone will correct me if I'm wrong. If you look at that group photo on the right, um, the man with the really striking white beard, I believe is Nassim Berenbaum, Nathan Berenbaum. Um, and the reason I want to call him out is that next session is uh, going to be five ways of looking up Beis Yaakov. I'm trying to remember what they were, but one of them is going to be Beis Yaakov as a Baal Tshuva movement. How do you understand Beis Yaakov? Beis Yaakov was a, a movement of people basically returning to Judaism. Even if they came from totally traditional homes, it still had the characteristics of a Baal Tshuva movement. And I think that that explains why Beis Yaakov was so crazy about Nuss and Berenbaum. Um, along with, let's say, uh, Franz Rosenzweig, the most famous um, Baal Tshuva, a secular Zionist Yiddishist who became a Baal Tshuva at the age at in, in 1911 and in 1929 was the executive uh, secretary of the world Aguda. Um, so he's an important person in later Beis Yaakov history. Okay, 1929 is also significant because in 1929 the Aguda realizes that it's Whereas in 1923, they're thinking, let's rescue a generation of young girls and find husbands for our poor bachelors to marry. Um, by 1929, it understood that um, basically it needed a parallel organization to the male organization um, for women. And with the founding of the Shea de Sisro, which was the last of the great sort of Beis Yaakov related um, initiatives, um, Orthodox women had an organized life within the Orthodox community from kindergarten till their entire lives. Um, Neshe Aguda Sisrael also is distinctive for having um, include, and I know Sarah Schneer was there, she must have been asked to speak, but, and she, it's possible that she did speak because we have something that looks like a speech at this conference. Um, but for whatever reason, she's not in this photograph. But you'll notice that the photograph already starts telling you that Beis Yaakov is, including Neshe, which is now the movement, the first and most important function of Neshe was to support Beis Yaakov and vice versa. Um, and Beis Yaakov, Neshe was comprised of women from London, Vilna, Vienna, um, Krakow, etc. It included, just like the first um, Aguda, a, a world conference, included the Gerareba's son-in-law who read a, um, a letter from the Gerareba. The founding of Neshe included um, uh, the Gerareba's wife, Rebetzin Alter, Fegemensha Alter, who was also his niece, because Hasidic dynasties are like that. Um, so uh, this, this is the dais. And you can already see it's a kind of wedding of East and West with the West, for the most part, lending financial support and moral support. Because in some of these places, there was no Beis Yaakov. Um, in other words, Beis Yaakov, they considered Beis Yaakov as something for Poland. So let me, um, so let me get to the, the heart of the question of, of how to think about Beis Yaakov from the question of East versus West. So. Um, Beis Yaakov, uh, Sarah Schneer herself gave Beis Yaakov two founding stories, almost like the two creation stories. Creation story number one is, is the, like the creation of Eve story. Um, creation story number one is she went to a, um, she was in Vienna as a refugee from Galicia during World War I, along with other refugees. And she's worried about finding a shul in Vienna. Are there really Jews? I don't think they're really Jews. Um, you know, for someone coming from Galicia, she finds one and she goes to bring a, 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 a sitter. And they say, no, you don't have to bring a sitter before Shabbos. We have Sidurim. Um, and she, she starts feeling a little more comfortable. And then she's sitting there at Shabbos Hanukkah, 1914, and up 
uh, stands um, the rabbi Rav Moshe David Flesh, who's a, a neo-Orthodox uh, Sam, Samson Rafael Hirsch type rabbi with roots back, like many of that crowd, with roots back in the Pressburg Yeshiva and the Chassam Sofer crowd. For those of you in the intricate weeds of the politics and geography of ultra-Orthodoxy. Um, and he does something really astonishing, which Sarsner had never seen before, which is he directs his sermon um, at the women of his congregation, and he praises women as great heroes of Jewish life. Now, praising women as great heroes of Jewish life is a staple of Jewish life. And it's rather shocking that it hadn't occurred to Orthodox men in Poland to take it up. But as a matter of fact, it hadn't. There was no tradition of, uh, you know, a from, you know, a Rosh Hashiva or Hasidic Rebbe speaking to women, much less giving a talk, praising them, maybe excoriating them, but not praising them. So this was something new, and she says she didn't doesn't remember exactly what it was about. It was about it was about Yehudis. She remembers that, and that's when she decided, if only the girls in Krakow could hear this. Um, I'm going to go back and start a school for them. That, that's the official founding story, according to Sarshner. So now we know that actually she'd been dreaming about doing something with girls from at least 1909, probably earlier, because we have her diary. So then the question is, what? Why did she grant Vienna this honor of giving it the inspiration? And I think that it's because the rather inchoate thought that she had of doing something to inspire Jewish girls and women um, was lent, sorry for the pun, was lent flesh by hearing a neo-Orthodox rabbi, how, it's, how it was being done in Germany. Um, under the influence of the 19th century um, founder of neo-Orthodox uh, Judaism in Germany, um, a whole system, a whole way of, of life um, that was what could be called a, a, a modern Orthodox, I think it's probably the kind of spiritual ancestor of many of the people listening today. Uh, uh, the, the, the slogan is Torah and Derech um, which is Torah and also impossible to translate, the way of the land, sometimes interpreted to mean, um, their hearts means respect for your elders, but here it means something like um, secular education, worldliness, things like that. Um, this was Samson Rafael Hirsch's uh, vision. And to talk about what's relevant here, he knew right from the start, unlike a lot of other people, that you have to include women as well as men. And his great works are addressed to, to Jewish men and Jewish women. Um, um, Jeshurun, I believe, or the, this is philosophical work, is dedicated to young men and young women. Uh, and the school he founded, which I have here, the Samson Rafal Hirsch School, the Real School, he started in Frankfurt in 1853, was actually co ed for the first year. I'll go back to that slide. It was, it was a co ed school. Um, and then it was separated into boys' classes and girls' classes, but they were in the same building. There was a, a, a hallway separating the boys from the girls. Boy, would that not have worked in my day, Siakko. Um, We weren't even allowed to go to the pizza store across the street. So, um, and there was a youth movement that included boys along with girls. It was called Ezra. Um, and the, the form of neo-orthodoxy that was, of course, it was sexually segregated, but there was no prohibition against, uh, Judith Rosenbaum grew up in Ezra, said she was never told that girls were not supposed to speak, to sing in front of boys. So girls and boys sang together, they went to shul together, they sat separately, but they were friends with each other, then they ended up marrying each other. Um, basically, in other words, this is totally unsuitable for Poland. Nothing in Poland would work, according to this, except Polish Jewry was so desperate and so lacked the capacity to reach Jewish girls, their own girls, their own daughters, um, that they had to look to the West for help, even if they had to be very careful to police that help and make sure it didn't cross over any lines. So who did it, it was Leo Deutschlander, um, who 
did everything I already mentioned and ran the Beis Yaakov in, in Vienna because Beis Yaakov also had a, a, a school and a seminary in, in Vienna, um, which is where a lot of Eastern European uh, refugees sent their daughters. So it was the kind of, you know, as opposed to the Realschule, it was where a lot of the, the Polish people ended up, the Galicianers. Um, I already talked about Judith Rosenbaum, who was sent to teach the girls at the summer class. That's a photo of her in the top right. Um, the Baustein is uh, one of the ways that um, the uh, Central European Jewish communities supported Beis Yaakov by selling bricks, quote unquote bricks, of the Beis Yaakov Seminary. Beis Yaakov Seminary was basically funded by, uh, the, the land was donated by, um, forget his name right now, a local uh, uh, Krakow Orthodox businessman, but the rest of the, uh, the rest of it was funded by um, German Jews and even more uh, American Jews. Um, and then there, what you, you have, the Marcus Lehman, I grew up on all of his books too. Um, German Jewry supplied the missing books that were supposed to substitute for the romance novels that the girls were reading before the German Jewish cavalry came along. So German Jewry provided um, all kinds of um, ways of just conceptualizing what it meant to uh, be orthodox and modern. Um, and in some ways, what they did was um, create um, Beis Yaakov as a modern school along the lines of the Real Shul. What do I mean by modern? Um, modern as in the idea of a class, as opposed to just one long share that goes from morning till night the idea of subjects, the idea of Judaism as a subject, yadus, the idea of um, uh, physical exercise, of gym, of PE, physical education, of art and music, all of these were borrowed from the German Jewish model um, and helped, as I say, professionalize it. Basically what this meant, and this is what I mean by um, Beis Yaakov being between Vienna and Krakow, is that a certain kind of unspoken um, bargain was struck, which is that Eastern U European men um, acknowledged more or less explicitly that they had no capacity for dealing with their cultural issues around girls and women. Um, they subcontracted to their German Jewish um, colleagues the problem of administration and professionalization. And German Jews were allowed into Polish Jewish life, but only as long as they stopped at the threshold of the male yeshiva. In other words, no German Jewish administrator would be welcome. I shouldn't say no, because um, the, the exception is um, Yavne in Lithuania, um, which brought Leo Deutschlander, the same guy in, to help them professionalize their own offerings for boys and for girls. But in Poland, in Hasidic Poland, um, those German Jews were welcome, but the strict sexual segregation, much stricter than anything the Germans knew about, meant that those, those German Jews were not welcome in the yeshivas, they had nothing to contribute to the traditional way of doing business as a Hasidic man. As far as women were concerned, they could um, do what they wanted. What this means is it's a really quite astonishing phenomenon. So basically what could be called a denomination, which also has a geographical character, which could be called modern Orthodox German Jewish way of life, was imported in a very restricted way to Poland um, and then um, restricted to women. So basically what this means is that Beis Yaakov girls were in some ways modern Orthodox compared to their brothers. They would have a much more professional education. Their exposure to things like grammar and foreign languages and literature was much higher. Um, in many ways, they were basically German Jews living in Poland. They even spoke German. As I said, my mother had to learn German to go to the seminary. Um, in Chernovitz. 
So, so what you get is, is something that's denominational and geographic and in its location from relocation from west to east, it becomes a gendered phenomenon. Um, so that's, that's what happens to German Jewry. I'll just talk for five more minutes about what Hasidism is. So at least we finished that topic. So I hope that that's clear. Hasidism is another story. Hasidism is the other, if you want to talk about what Sarah Schneer produced, she produced a marriage of German Jewish neo-Orthodoxy neo and Hasidic Eastern European Orthodoxy. So Hasidism, you think, well, that's simple. Well, of course, Hasid uh, Beis Yaakov was Hasidish. So many of the girls came from Hasidish homes. Sarah Schneer herself was Hasidish. The other foundation story, she says, is that she went to the Bells of the Rebbe and got his permission before she opened her first Beis Yaakov. She might have been inspired by Rabbi Flesh, but his permission would get her nowhere in Krakow. She needed the permission of, of a Rebbe. So she got the permission of a Rebbe. She opens her school. Of course, it's Hasidic. That's not true. You can't, it, it, it's, it's an easy mistake to make. There basically was no way to be a Hasidic girl in, when Sarah Schneer opened Beis Yaakov. I mean, you could have a Hasidic father, you could have a Hasidic mother, but basically what that meant was that you had people harassing you in the house. There wasn't anything to do. There wasn't any way to learn about being Hasidic. There wasn't any way to perform your own Hasidism. Sarah Schneider talked about it explicitly. She says, basically what being Hasidic meant was that your father and your brothers would leave the house um, for, you know, six weeks a year from from our Scottish El, or, or however long, you know, to be at the Rebbe's court. And we don't have any holiday at all. Basically what, the, what Sarah Schneira did is that she recreated, um, she recreated Hasidism for women and girls. Um, and what this means is that she created teachings and she created a form of Hasidism. People are going like with, with Beis Yaakov, um, Ger, because so many Ger Hasidim sent their daughters there. Was it Bells because Sarah Schneer herself had? No, it was entirely Sarah Schneer's own invention. Basically, Sarah Schneer invented, the only reason why it's not called yet another Hasidic sect is because Sarah Schneer was a woman. And you, you know, you can't have it. Um, she basically recreated Hasidic life for girls and women. So what do you do if, if, if going to the court Paying, paying homage to the Rebbe, you can't do it. Well, in some sense, she was a Rebbe. I talked about this last time. Um, travel was such a huge part of Hasidic uh, life, including not just travel to the courts, but also she went to Mariambad, traveled to the spas. Hasidim loved to follow the Rebbes to the spas. Now, girls and women could go to the spas and she set up life, she set up shop in the spas in Zakopane and on the mountains of the Rabka. Basically all the places that were becoming hot spots for Hasidic Rebbe's, Sarah Schneer rented a house for the season and brought her girls there. Um, the other thing she did, I mean, a pilgrimage to Hasidic, to, 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 to Rebbe's uh, tombstones. Well, you know, the, 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 the living Rebbe's aren't, going to welcome a bunch of teenage girls uh, traipsing in one day, but the dead rebels couldn't object. So Sarshner instituted new rituals where the girls paraded down the streets of Krakow, proudly 200 strong, to go every Rosh Chodesh to Davin at the grave of the Ramah, um, which is still there in the old cemetery. Um, I think that's it. I don't know. I just grabbed that off, the Google, off of Google a few minutes ago. Um, but I have been there. Now there's a, no, it can't be it because there's a big like gate around it now. And then the other thing she did is this, she just created, you know, it, it, she created Hasidism in her own image. I mean, who was going to stop her, right? So she created these rituals. She had already told you about, you know, that one ritual was, I don't know, Tuba Av suddenly became a huge holiday. And Tuba, Sarah Schneer, we owe the, the revival of Tuba Av to Sarah Schneer. It was, if, if you look in the archives, there are all these pamphlets. How do you, how do you celebrate Tuba Av? Um, she created liturgy around Tuba Av. She created rituals. Um, she, uh, and all kinds of nature. For her, Hasidism was about worshiping God in nature. 
There's one, um, one uh, memoir describes how Sarshnera would start. I think it was either Gimel Sivan, or I have to go back and check when it was. It might have been Tuba'av, where you start at the bottom of the mountain um, and you uh, uh, start hiking, the girls hand in hand, and in the middle of the night, you come to a clearing and you build a fire, just like the stories about the Baal Shem Tov, and you dance around and you, say, you sing Koto Marlo Vet Yaakov, and you sing other Vet Yaakov songs, and then you, you um, keep hiking and you reach the top of the mountain right at sunrise, and then you dive in Shacharis at, you know, uh, on the top of the mountain at sunrise. This was, this was Sarashnera's Hasidism. So to say that this was a Hasidic movement is to not notice how it was her own brand of Hasidism, how she reinvented in the same way that, that German neo-Orthodoxy had to be transformed to make it work for Poland and turned into a girl's phenomenon. Um, Hasidism had to be not moved from west to east, but moved from the men's space to the women's space and reimagined to encompass girls of every type. Um, and to attract girls of every type. Um, so in this way, Sarah Schneer proudly, so this isn't just me, I'm not just the one who says, she said, this is, this is what Beis Yaakov is, 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 is um, we, we got a lot from the East, from the, from the West when we started, but now we've rediscovered our own, we've mined our own traditions, and now what we, the, the enthusiasm and the passion and the, the frumkite that we got from our Polish um, surroundings is something that we can return back um, to our Central European um, colleagues and, and friends and sisters. She would use the term sister. She loved the term sister. So that's my understanding of Beis Yaakov between East and West. And I've already been talking for a long time. So but we have maybe 10 minutes for questions or so. Sure, we have a, a, a few for questions. If, uh, if you prefer, I'm all happy to tell you. I'll read the questions for you. Sure. Um, and then maybe afterwards we can unmute everybody if you have anyone to ask orally. But uh, um, how can these highly educated girls marry many of the local men? I imagine, you know, wh why would they be attracted to them? Uh, were the men intimidated by any of this? <laughs> the, uh, basically, these sophisticated girls referred to um, yeshiva boys as the uh, yeshiva boy was an ummensch, a non-man. Um, I mean, it was horrible. I mean, one of the things I said is it, at the 1903 conference, someone said, how do you expect a marriage to be happening between a girl like that, who's, you know, the, the Rebbe's daughters, right? We have all these memoirs of the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's daughters sitting in their parlor weeping over Polish novels. Um, and then, you know, they're going to want to marry some, you know, hemorrhoidal, you know, pale. They're looking for, for, for romance. This is what modernity has to offer us, romance. Um, Sarah Schneer had to provide an alternative to that. So that was the problem. That was why there was a, a marriage crisis, um, precisely because these sophisticated girls did not want to marry their male counterparts. Okay. Um, if you had to learn, learn German to enter the seminary, uh, how did that affect attendance, basically? <laughs> I, you know, it was Beis Yaakov, like the Yeshiva Sochbe was deliberately um, selective. In other words, it was even more selective than, it was very hard to get into. And in other words, if you hear that somebody got into the, the seminary, you had to pass a test, on, you had to be able to answer questions on Bracious and Shmos with all the Rashi. You had to um, have read um, Hirsch's 19 letters. You had to know all about how to daven. I have to say, I didn't learn how to daven. You know, just being from doesn't make you, you know, understand how to daven. Um, and you had to be able to understand a, a German lecture. Um, it was, its, it's selectivity was, was part of its attraction. Um, I mean, after a certain, I mean, there was, there were certain, some people who uh, wanted, who their parents, 
made them go. One of the memoirs we have is from Gutta Sternbuch. Her parents made them go. But mostly these are people who are working really hard to get in. Um, I mean, we're talking about a 10 year period to get into Sarsenier's original seminary didn't require that. It was just when it got professionalized. The first thing that Orleanda did when he took over in the early 30s is he slashed admission from, I think, 150 to 120, just to make it even more difficult. It was a kind of, I mean, you know, boys were doing it. Girls do it, you know, if they, if, if you set a, your sights at something. Anyway, I should just say that Sarschner already knew German. These girls, the sophisticated urban girls in, in, in Krakow, some of them just knew German because they were, I mean, they were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They, they vacationed in Vienna. German is close enough to Yiddish that you have a leg up. Um, a lot of them just knew German anyway. It's kind of interesting because in, in a certain sense that like defeat, I mean, if her purpose is to rescue these girls, you would think you'd want to have a more of an open door policy, but just uh, mm. I find that kind of interesting, a little bit of a, I don't know what I call it the contradiction, but okay. Um, somebody's writing that they were in the impression mode that a lot of the Hasidic families didn't want their kids going to Beis Yaakov, it was too modern for them. So what, uh, what percentage of students are, are Hasidic and non-Hasidic? Um, so Besyakov, uh, Besyakov got a huge share. So, so the biggest um, Orthodox, the biggest Hasidic group in Poland in the interwar period was Ger. Um, it was a quarter of a million. And the Ger Rebbe was among the, I mean, Besyakov and Ger were like that. So, you know, Besyakov at its height had around 40,000 students. So just from Ger alone, they filled a lot of their schools. Um, but there were other, I mean, there were other non-Hasidic girls that went there. There were non-Orthodox girls who went to the small schools um, because they were attracted to the play often. Um, so, so, so Ger was a big proportion. I don't know exactly what proportion, but it was a kind of, uh, you know, noticeable percentage. And the, the Ger Rebbe's daughter went to the seminary, um, Rifka Alter. Um, Bells and Babiv were against it. Monkat was against it. Um, the second biggest uh, Hasidic group was Alexander. I think they were also against it. So most of the Hasidic sects, I think, were against. Um, so it tended to be those Hasidic groups that were open to Aguda were open to Beis Yaakov. As I said, there were also these cases where other schools open for these other Hasidic sects um, under different names because the need was so dire. And what were you gonna do with your girls? Um, so, so, so there's all kinds of, uh, you know, sort of gray areas between who sent their daughters and who didn't. Um, but Bells and Bubbiv were the big ones that, that uh, went against it. Is so apparently I just discovered that Bubbiv actually, the Bubbiv Rebbe continued, I mean, the Bells and Rebbe continued to uh, advise Sarah Schneer into the 20s. I just discovered this a few days ago. Um, even though he didn't want his own daughters. And, you know, the, his, the basic reason was that um, the problem was that it was a pan-Hasidic school. It wasn't, it didn't limit itself to girls of a certain type. It was a, it was a missionary school, it was pan-Hasidic, and they just, it was too strange for them. It was too, they wanted to keep their own people close. Somebody pointed out that Gary Rebitson looked quite quite modern in the picture you had. Everybody this. always says that. <laughs> he was younger. I mean, the first Gary Rebitson died, and then he married this woman who who wore a hat that it didn't even look like all her hair. There, there's a lot of famous pictures of this woman who was quite modern looking and quite... Um, if you Google... There's a picture of her in the New Hasidism book where she looks like a flapper. She's wearing a... Uh, I mean, you know, she wasn't exactly, I don't know how to describe it. it, it even the Rebbitsons, they couldn't even find Rebbitsons that looked like a Rebbitson should look. And most, by the way, one of the things that was discovered at the Nishay conference was that women in Eastern Europe were less likely to wear Scheitloch than women than in the neo-Orthodox world. Mm -hmm. So... So what constitute, I mean, there were all kinds of what could be called mixed marriages 
of, of a really from guy and a basically modern woman. Um, and these were not at all uncommon, but to discover that the Ger Rebbe had one of these is, is quite striking. Uh, somebody wanted to know any any Spartic um, girls come from any of the Spartic. Ah, girls? interesting. Um, so, in, I don't know about Sephardic girls in Eastern Europe, but the story of, of Sephardic and Mizrahi girls in Israel is, uh, you know, in Palestine and then Israel. So, so Beis Yaakov intentionally reached out to, uh, you know, sort of Mizrahi uh, new immigrants. Um, and also people from the old Yishuv, and um, it tried to, um, and had, I, I forget what they were called, had, had dormitories. They were particularly, I think they a little bit, part I don't quote me on this because I have to do some more research on it, but I know they had dormitories for girls from Sephardic backgrounds, and I'm wondering whether it was a kind of female variation of the you know, the attempt to bring in and save, um, to save the girls from the, um, the Mabarot and places where they'd become um, secular. I'm not entirely sure what the ideology was. I just hired an Israeli research assistant, so I want to find out more about that. But um, there now, Beis Yaakov's are, are, you know, they took over the, the field of, of education among that community too. I mean, in the same way that you see these Moroccan Jews who look like they're Chassidim or Aguda people. Um, and it's, some of you might know that there was a, a, a kind of a controversy around the Beis Yaakov of Emmanuel, which put up a fence um, between, it, in its own campus, to divide controversial, either to divide the more religious from the less religious girls or to divide the Ashkenazic from the Sephardic girls. Um, and this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Israel and parents were arrested. And so, um, so, so there's definitely an interesting history to be written about Mizrahi girls in Beis Yaakov, but I don't know if I'm the person to write it. <laughs> okay, and somebody wants to know, um, claiming uh, they may not have taught Rashi that, uh, that before the war. So Rashi is, was a good, I, I found, they certainly taught Rashi in the seminary, and not just Rashi, but Malbim and, and Svorno. I mean, they taught all the rabbinic commentaries. Um, they, I mean, they basically learned the way we did, the rabbinic Bible with the commentaries. Um, the, uh, in the, um, one of the memoirs that we have of someone who went to Beis Yaakov, we have a few really great memoirs that are really very specific. One of them is from one of those Yivo autobiographies where it was a contest and someone wrote that, one of them is all about Beis Yaakov. And she said that she went to hear, Sarah Schneer came to her town and she went with her father and um, she heard Sarah Schneer um, speak and she was walking home with her father and she said, I wanna go, I wanna learn Chumash and Rashi. And her father said, Chumash yes, Rashi no. So it's possible that in and, you know it's possible that in the smaller schools, at least some of the smaller schools, they didn't learn Rashi, but they certainly learned Rashi in the seminary, and I have no doubt that they must have also learned Rashi in at least some of the more sophisticated or bigger um, uh, schools. Okay, and this uh, I very interesting. Did the Mizrahi religious Zionist movement have its own girls' school? Did they send their girls to non-Zionist Beis Yaakov schools? So yeah, it's interesting. In Lithuania, the um, the Yavne schools were combined um, Mizrahi and Aguda. I mean, it was non-denominational at the beginning. Um, the Mizrahi schools in Poland were also called Yavne, very confusing, a much smaller school system than Beis Yaakov. Um, and I don't know so much about it, but I do know that in, in Lithuania, um, the question of Zionist, anti-Zionist, Mizrahi versus Aguda was, at least in the 1920s, a lot less of a charge topic and was a lot more crossover. But basically, I mean, there was also crossover in Beis Yaakov, not on the part of the uh, leaders, but on the part of families, because people's affiliations were very, very fluid in the interwar period, especially in the 20s when these movements were just getting underway.